please join us for a while in the Word of God. We welcome you to our program, From House to House, where we endeavor to share the Word of God with the believers, and also for the sake of those that might not know the Lord, that they may hear the truth and be set free, that they may know the Lord who has come to give life, and that more abundantly. We uh, I want to have you join us on this particular series that we have been teaching. We're into it in good ways. And um, we're talking about a royal wedding song dealing with Psalms 45. This was written by the sons of Korah, who happened to be the temple assistants, and they wrote it for the director of music, that it might be used in worship there. It is considered very possibly written for the sake of the wedding of King Solomon. But that is uh, the historical part. The spiritual part that has application for us today as believers is that it's very prophetical. It's not only poetic, but it's prophetical. It projects into the future and is a beautiful portrait of things that will signify a coming day when Jesus Christ, King of Kings, our heavenly King Solomon, which means peaceable one, when he will take up his bride and the wedding will be presented. The wedding of the bride and the groom, the wedding of the Lord who gave his very life for the sake that he might purchase himself a bride, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Of course, that only being possible through the blood that he shed at Calvary that makes us clean and makes us whole. Today, we're going to, uh, ladies, as you turn to your Psalms 45, we're going to look specifically at verse 9. We've moved down that far. It won't be long. We'll be wrapping this series up. And the particular lesson in this series of a royal wedding song happens to be lesson number nine, and we're calling this one The Bridal Queen. Now, so far, all of our conversation in our lessons has been in regards to the king himself, spiritually our king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ, who we're looking forward to his coming and him setting up his kingdom. But this now is going to begin to speak about his bride, which we can understand as application to his church. So let's look at that verse, and I'm going to read it, first of all, in the Life Application Study Bible. I'm going to read Psalms 45, verse 9. There it reads, Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. And I want you to notice uh, a few particular things that this is in reference to the bride and, and she's a daughter of a king. She's an honored woman. She will be one at the right hand of this king that she's marrying. And she is considered not just a bride, but a royal bride. And she will stand there in the gold of Ophir. And those are different highlights that we want to bring to your attention as we endeavor to do that today in this particular lesson. Now, I want to also read that same text of verse 9 in the Amplified Version, and it is put this way. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Life application used the words royal bride. The Amplified uses the words queen. And gold of Ophir, and we want to play up on both words as we present the lesson today. Now, <clears throat> first of all, let's recognize the fact that it says that the bride will be the daughter of a king. She will be the daughter of a king. It's made up of daughters of kings. In other words, this bride is not one just taken from some poor little valley down below of a very humble people or a desperate people or so forth. And of course, we're speaking symbolically here and not in reference to people in the literal. But she will come from a family that is of a royal bloodline. His bride, his church will be of a royal bloodline. She will be the daughter 
of a king, and no less, to, to stand fitted to be beside this grand king of all kings. And you see, well, Carol, what bearing does that have for us today? Well, we are spiritually of a royal bloodline. Did you know that? Now, in the natural, I'm not. <laughs> I don't have anything to brag about necessarily that, that I'd want to advertise as to who I am, who, who I've come from, and so forth, just all of simplicity and humble means. But in the spirit realm, I can boast in the Lord. I can't boast in my flesh, but I can boast in the Lord. Didn't the psalmist say that he would make his boast in the Lord? The humble would hear thereof, and they would be glad. Well, you as a child of God, you need to understand your heritage spiritually. If you have allowed the Heavenly Father to adopt you, wherein in your heart the Spirit is crying, Daddy, Father, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, even as Jesus cried out, Abba, Father. If you have allowed that Spirit of life, the Spirit of Christ to be born within you, then you are born not only the spirit, but you are born of a royal seed. You are born of a royal bloodline. Of course, this is in regards to your second birth, not your natural birth, your spiritual birth that Jesus spoke of, that a man must be born again, or he would not see the kingdom of God. You may be listening to me and say, but Carol, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think I'm of any royal bloodline. Well, Spiritually, you can be just like the rest of us that are so fortunate to be adopted by the Heavenly Father, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, you can call upon his name and be saved. The scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it needs to be through the name of Jesus that you come, which means Savior. He, for he alone can be the Savior of our soul. And when you surrender your life to God, and you ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Savior, then you are born anew by the Spirit and you become of a new bloodline spiritually. You are, as it were symbolically, the daughter of a king, a part of that bride, that church that Jesus gave himself for. The, the uh, fact is, ladies, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is that Children that are born into this world, they don't take after their mother's bloodline. No, they take after the father's bloodline. And so you and I, when we're born of the Spirit, we take after the Heavenly Father's bloodline. Here, this is speaking of the royal bride. She's going to be uh, made up of daughters of kings. So it's wonderful to be elevated to that position and yet not be haughty or proud, but just so grateful. That's the word I want to stress, but just be so grateful that you've been adopted into the family of God, not on the merits of your own, but because you've humbled your heart and you've called upon the Lord, knowing you need him as your savior. Now what it says uh, in Jeremiah, Again, I'm going to say, ladies, don't lose Psalms 45 because we're going through it verse by verse and phrase by phrase. We're going to continue to revert back there, so don't lose it. But let's branch out now and look at Jeremiah 46, verse 18. In the King James, I'm going to read that. And I just want you to be aware that the Word of God declares that the Lord Himself is that King, okay? As I live, saith the King, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Surely as Tabor is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. So here the Lord is declaring himself to be not someone inferior, but he says he is the king. And this king, his name is the Lord of hosts. So we've stamped it right there like a certificate with the authority that he is backing this up. He is the king. We are in one sense like the king's daughters when we're talking about the bride of Jesus Christ. Of course, there's going to be many men, <laughs> many male persons, a part of this body of Christ. It's not just a select group of us in the natural women and ladies, the females. But for the sake of teaching, for the sake of understanding, the Lord uses different types of pictures to give us a different side of the message. 
And when he speaks of us being his bride or his glorious church without spot or wrinkle, he likens us to like daughters of a king. Sorry, fellas, I know you do listen, but sorry to, to uh, I'm not trying to offend you, but that's just scripturally so. But take it for its symbolic purpose, all right? Now, it says in that Psalms 45, 9, going back to that, as I said we would, it says, daughters of kings are among your honored women. So this bride will be made up of people who have lived a life for God that he can honor. Did you know that we're not only to honor the king and honor the Lord, but the Lord would like to honor us? Isn't that amazing that we just us simpletons of this earth, creatures of the dust of this earth, that the Lord himself would want to honor us as well. But yes, this bride, this, this company of people, his believers, they will be those that are persons that their life could be honored by God. And we should have a desire that we would live a life that God can honor. Not every, everybody's life is all that honorable, true? So we should aim by the graces and the spirit of God dwelling within us that as we give it right away to take leadership in us and through us, that our lifestyle would be such that God can honor it even before the eyes of man, that they will see that our life has been honored by the hand of God. We could see a, a, a glimpse and a picture of this when we consider Eli the priest in the Old Testament days when Samuel was just young and dedicated to the temple and he grew up to be a prophet of God, a mighty prophet of God and mightily used of God and a leader of God's people. But while he was there in his youth, uh, the Lord dealt with the priest who was the head of all the worship there among the children of Israel in his particular day. And God could not honor that man anymore, even though he had this high position of being the priest over the worship and over the Lord's people. God could not honor him. Why? Because he failed to honor God. And I want us to learn a principle here, ladies. Would you turn in your Bibles now to 1 Samuel, the second chapter and the 30th verse in the King James Version, we'll see what God thinks as God speaks, okay? Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, These, this is not the words of men, this is the words of God. I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Isn't it a shame that in the latter years of this man's life, the servant of God, the man of God in the house of God, the man that was leading God's people, supposed to be the example for the way to go for God's people. And lo and behold, he failed in the area of the discipline of his sons. He allowed them to do what they wanted to do. Yes, he spoke to them, but the scripture says he failed to restrain them. They were doing things that were very disgusting and displeasing to God, contrary to the ways of godliness. And so God it required that this father, Eli, who happened to be the priest, would also take care of his family, his household properly, and he failed to do so. He might have been great in ministry, but he failed at home. And, you know, that's very possible uh, to have happen when you're caught up in doing the things of the Lord. Those of you that are involved in ministry, you must be careful that you look well to the ways of your household at the same time and keep that balanced because the Lord's going to be looking there just as seriously as he is when you're on the platform or you're in front of a television camera or wherever your outlet is that you share the word of God. Eli failed to do it. And therefore, God considered it as a fact that he had failed to honor God in not doing that and not restraining his sons. God considered that as failing to honor God and honor God's rules and God's ways. And God said, if you don't honor me, I can't honor you, is what it comes down to, as we would say, the bottom line. Women of God, I encourage you. 
that are here with me today, I encourage you that you would look well to not only your spiritual life and your practical living, but the ways of your household, as much as you have control and responsibility for, that in all your ways you endeavor with God's strength and help and a, an ability that he gives because you're leaning on him and calling upon him, that you will be honoring God in all your ways so that then God can honor you. What a wonderful thing to walk a walk that God is able to honor you like he would like to. So this is what it's describing here in Psalms 45, 9. His bride, the king of kings' bride, will be a people that can be honored. They won't be like Eli the priest, who was moved out of his role promptly by the hand of God because he failed in that area. Then that ninth verse, back to Psalms 45 again, that ninth verse goes on to say that daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride. At your right hand. Let's think for a moment about standing at the right hand. The, the Amplified Version uses the word, your honorable women at your right hand stands the queen. That's where she stands. What a privilege to stand at the right hand of the king because at the right hand is considered the position of authority, the position of power, the position of favor. And she is not put back in some side room as someone unimportant, but she's moved right on up to stand right beside the king in his authority and in his power as a joint heir. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus said to us ladies in his word, he said that we were going to be given the privilege to be joint heirs with him, not somebody that is going to follow along behind him um, as, as something inferior, as something to be ashamed of, but no, he moves us right forward. Again, I must say, not with arrogance or haughtiness or better than thou or a holier than thou attitude, but he moves us right beside him to be at his right hand of his authority and his power. And he gives us the responsibility to demonstrate that through the Holy Ghost that's operative in our lives. Let's consider this uh, for a little bit, the subject of standing at the right hand. Do you know that God expressed himself in the book of Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter and the 30th verse, and he said that there was this, this occasion when he was looking for someone that would stand in the gap and make up the hedge for him in the land so that he would not have to destroy it, but he couldn't find anybody. What a pity, what a sad picture here that God himself sought for someone who would be willing to stand in a gap, make up the hedge so that it would be solidified. It would be a wall of protection and preservation, but he couldn't find anybody to fill that role. Well, the Lord is looking for a people that's willing to stand at his right hand, in a sense, in the position of an intercessor. The, the position of a petitioner, one that will call upon the name of the Lord in a position of spiritual authority and power through the Holy Ghost. Call upon his name on the behalf of others. For the sake of others, the Lord couldn't find any. You see, what, what the Lord was speaking of here in Ezekiel 22, 30, he, he was speaking of the land and how de de desperate it was in its conditions. And it was on the verge of being destroyed. So God was looking for somebody as a good reason to save the land for. I'm going to read that. It says, And I sought a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I think that's one of the saddest verses in the scripture that when God had to look for somebody to fill a role, he couldn't find anybody. When God is looking for somebody to pray for your neighborhood, to pray for your relatives, your family, when he's looking for somebody to pray for your nation, to pray for situations, and he looks and he has to overlook you because you're not willing to take up that responsibility. How sad that would be. May you be a volunteer and say, Lord, when you're looking for somebody to stand in a position of intercession, to stand in the gap and make up that hedge so there be no loss, 
I'm willing, I volunteer, Lord, that your spirit can call upon me to pray when there's a need, a special need to prayer. You know, there's times when a missionary on a field is, is in desperate circumstances, maybe life-threatening, and they're saying, oh God, cause somebody back home to pray. I wonder, are your ears in tune in case the Holy Spirit would wanna pick you and say, go pray, drop the vacuum, put down the dishes, go do this or that, and go pray. Go cry out and pray. There's someone standing in the need of the prayer right now at this very hour. Many people's lives have been spared because someone heard when the Spirit said, go pray right now, drop what you're doing, go pray. Are you willing to be obedient to do that and take that place? I trust you'll be willing to do that, just like Esther was. Let's look, ladies, quickly at Esther 5, verse 1 through 4, and how she stood there in the, in the sight of the king and found favor, and she was a petitioner for the salvation of her people, or they would have all been destroyed. It says, on the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the royal or inner court of the king's palace. Opposite his throne room, the king was sitting on his throne, facing the main entrance of the palace. And when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And he held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king said to her, What will you have, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of the kingdom. And Esther said, If it seems good to the king, let the king and Haman come this day to the dinner that I have prepared for them. Her motive was in preparing that dinner is that she was going to maneuver things into the point where she could ask for the life of her people that uh, had been um, assigned to be slaughtered and to death. So she was willing to be an intercessor. Oh, this people that's going to make up this body of this royal bride that Christ is coming for and is going to be wedded to will be a people who are willing to not only stand in a gap, but they'll be willing to stand at his right hand as petitioners and intercessors. I hope you're one of those people that volunteer. Her position of favored authority and power was what was significant in her hour. And the Lord has given us a position and responsibility in the word. As we read that, ladies, in Luke 10, verse 19, it says, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample on serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. So the Lord assigns us, through the Holy Ghost, authority and power to defeat the works of the devil. And that is a position he's given to us. Are you willing to fill it? We um, move on and see that that reference in Psalms 45, 9 calls her not only the, the queen, but calls her a royal bride. Yes, because she's going to reign and rule with her beloved bridegroom. Revelation 5, 10 says, and you have made them a kingdom, royal race and priests to our God, and they shall reign as kings over the earth. You say, who, Carol, who? Who? Well, the body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made us to be a royal kingdom, a royal race, a priesthood unto him. And we are to reign as kings over the earth. Can you imagine someday, little old you, little old me, will be filling those kind of shoes if we are faithful before the Lord. Now it says back and going back again to Psalms 45, 9 to finish out that verse. It says that she's going to stand there in what? Not in rags, she's going to stand there in the gold of Ophir. Ophir was the name of a place that means abundance of gold. This place that was famous for, for its gold, for its exquisite gold, possibly it's thought in Arabia or Africa, her, in her garments would be this gold, which symbolizes trial and fires that she has come through but has overcome and let's read that in Job's 23 10 to explain that to us it says but he knows the way that I take he has concern for it appreciates and pays attention to it when he has tried me I shall come forth as refined gold pure and luminous 
And Revelation 3.21, in closing, it says, He who overcomes is victorious. I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne, as I myself overcame, was victorious, and sat down beside my Father on his throne. Where are we going to get the gold for our garments? It's going to be as we go through these fiery trials, but we come out as overcomers. How? By his grace, by his grace, child of God. So be strengthened and encouraged today. If you're in fiery trials, just know that it's separating the dross from the gold, the wonderful, valuable gold. We will stand before him in the gold of Ophir as we have come through our trials and our testings. I thank you for being with us today, and I want to encourage you to join us next time for the subject of bridal instructions. Until then. God be with you. Amen. Let flowers bloom, O oh Lord, where tears have fallen. Let our hearts as your earth and footstool you. Reason righteousness, the Lord's own plenty. Program Copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34. DVDs, $44. At $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. Original Carol Brooks song album. Audio cassettes, $10 each. CDs, $14 each. At $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For orders and support gifts, call toll-free 1-866-777-4748 or call 1-619-445-0751. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the World Wide Web, visit carolbrookministries.com. Email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line numbers are 1-541-592-4539 or 1-619-401-9389.